Act in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. You will hear two students talking about university clubs and societies. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, are you the person to ask about joining a club? Yes, I am. What would you like to know? Well, I'm interested in several things, but I'd like to know more about the different clubs and how much they cost. I'm looking for a small club that's not too expensive. OK. Have a look at this table. You can see the names of the clubs, the fees, and the number of members. I'm afraid they aren't in any order. If you look at the top of the list, the first club is table tennis. That's one of our new clubs. Oh, right. So the table tennis club costs £20. That's quite expensive. Yes, it is a bit expensive. The cross-country cycling club is cheaper, though. Membership fees are only £15, but on the other hand... It's got a hundred members. The film and drama club costs a lot, doesn't it? Yes. Fifty pounds is a lot. And that's probably why it only has twelve members. Ah, uh, is there any other club you think looks interesting? Look at the next one. Street dance. Have you ever done any street dance? No, I haven't really. It's the cheapest. It only costs five pounds. Mm. OK. Shall we start with your interests? What do you like doing best? Um. well, I like photography. I've got a professional camera, so I take it quite seriously. But I can't really imagine belonging to a club to take photographs. I usually go on long walks on my own and take photos. So I like photography, but I wouldn't want to join a club to do it. OK. So what else do you like doing? Running? Oh, no, not running. I like walking, but I hate running. I'm afraid the running club isn't for me, or the cycling club. And film and drama? Ah, uh, no, it's far too expensive. But I do like yoga. I've practised yoga on and off for years. How many members does the yoga club have? It's always a small group. A lot of people sign up at the beginning of term, but they stop going after a few weeks so they're left with a few regular members every year. That sounds good. I think I'd like to join the yoga club. And what about the contemporary dance club? Is it expensive? Contemporary dance? No. It's not expensive. Ten pounds for the term. Do you like dance? Well, I've never tried contemporary dance, but I do like jazz and tap dance. How often does the group meet? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So, can I have your full name, please? Victoria Mandeville. M-A-N-D-A-V-I-L? No, no. M-A-N-D-E-V-I-L-L-E. -E. Double L-E. Thank you. And how old are you? 19. And your address? 57. Berry Gardens, Atherton Park, Manchester, M46. How do you spell Berry? B-E-R-R-Y? No, 
It's B U R Y. Right, B U R Y. And do you have a contact number? Yes, my mobile is zero seven nine four two five seven three two seven nine. Oh seven nine four two five seven three two seven nine. Yes, that's right. Is that all? Uh, one more thing. Do you have an email address? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a talk by a security worker from Sydney Airport, who is introducing the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi everyone and welcome to Sydney Airport. Today I'll be giving you the inside information on the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service here. We hope to provide you with a better understanding of why such heavy security regulations are necessary by educating you on how we operate and why we do the things we do. We're not here to try to persuade you to fly through Sydney Airport, though we hope you'll find your experience relatively stress-free and comfortable. First things first, our personnel. Can anyone guess how many people work at Sydney Airport? We have 200 alone working in Terminal 2, so can you guess how many in the whole airport? I heard someone say 360. That's getting closer. What? Did someone say 2,000? That's way too high. Sydney Airport actually employs 440 people. A lot, right? And about half of those employees work in security-related matters. Moving on to our not-so-human employees, let's come and see our favourite pooch, Milton. Milton is our best drug-sniffing dog on the force. He's friendly to most people. You can even come pet him at the end of our tour. Burnouts, beware though. He'll find everything. Notice that even though there are so many of us around him, Milton stays quite calm. This is the precise reason he was chosen for the job. Dogs that are chosen are not predisposed to sniff out different narcotics. That's something we teach them already. So here's a part of the airport most people never notice, the cargo transport terminal. This is where packages are shipped to and from. Normally, we ship around 4,400 packages per month. In this airport alone, over 52,000 packages were shipped in and out over the past year. We ship to and from 170 different countries. Not bad, eh? Probably it will go up to over 72,000 packages this year. And despite over 100 flights in and out of here daily, the number of lost or delayed packages is impressively low. If you send your package through here, Rest assured, we'll get it where it's going. Let's move on to the area most of us are familiar with, the passenger terminals. In order to be allowed into this area, you must pass through security with your ticket and, if you're travelling internationally, your passport. If you're travelling domestically, you just need a legal form of ID. If you don't have those, you will not be allowed to pass through security and board your flight. 
During the security scan, your carry-on items will be checked for dangerous items such as weapons, sharp objects, and liquids that exceed our specified limit. If you attempt to pass any of the prohibited items on this list posted at the entrance, you are still allowed to board the plane, but you'll be given a warning, and your item will be confiscated. Don't worry, we will not arrest you for having too much shampoo in your bag or anything like that. We also search your carry-ons and parcels for any perishable items. We prohibit the transportation of local vegetation and prohibit parcels containing any insects in them. You may or may not have learned about this in biology class, but when some plants are introduced to a new environment, they spread wildly and wipe out the current species around it. It is important to control the introduction of new plants into an ecosystem, so we must prohibit the transport of any fertile seeds. So, what happens to parcels containing possibly suspicious items? It's of course something we do not take lightly here. If an object passes through the scanner that appears suspicious in any way, it is separated out for manual search by a member of our trained security personnel. If an illegal plant or simple sharp object like a pocket knife is found, it is simply disposed of in our biohazard waste containers, and the package itself is returned to the sender or passenger if it is for a passenger flight. More serious weapons are reported to higher authorities for investigation. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. As far as parcel security, the material of the parcel is important. For shipped goods, the most common material used and the most widely accepted is paper. Make sure it is packed sturdy enough with no rips or tears. We've definitely had packages rip open before due to haphazard packing. A more common problem, though, is the package labels. When an item does not make it to the right place, this is the most common reason. The label may not be in the right place or marked clearly enough. If you're receiving any items from abroad that must be declared, please remember our guidelines in order to ensure the timely delivery of your item. Make sure it is packed correctly, and we ask that you notify customs between two and ten days within the item's scheduled arrival date. Okay, before we move on, are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two people who are about to share a project at work. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm OK now, Sarah. But I was so ill last week. Oh, dear. What was the problem? Did you eat that dodgy fish in the canteen? No. At first, I thought it was a cold. But then my head started hurting and my eyes started to go blurry. Oh, I'm so sorry. That sounds serious. 
Yeah, it's okay, actually. I went to the doctor and he diagnosed me with a migraine. He gave me some medicine and I'm starting to feel much better. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Well, I'm also glad you're in today because we have to work on a new project together. Oh, are we in the same section? No, it's just us. No one else. Mr Donaldson put us down as B-team because we live near each other. That could be fun. What do we have to do? Well, the project is partly internet research, then checking reference books for information to prepare a survey, which we have to use with people we know. Great. What's the topic? It's to do with shopping over the last ten years. We have to find out how customers have changed their behaviour. OK, so what's the first step? I think the first thing to do is to check the list of references he gave me. But my computer is in for repair, so if I check in the reference library, would you be willing to look up some references online? Once we're done with the reference checks, we can write the questions together. That's fine. I'll do the internet research. So what sort of shopping are we looking at? Only food or goods or clothes shopping? We have to find people who are willing to tell us about personal things, like deodorants, cosmetics, soap or vitamin creams. The other groups are doing food, electrical goods and clothes. That won't be so easy, Sarah. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People might think those things are a bit private. Yes, I thought about that. I'll ask the women and you can ask the men. That should work OK. Well, if you think so. Give me the list of references then. Sorry, I left them in my other bag at Joseph's house. I'll get them for you tomorrow. OK. Well then, this afternoon, I think I'll catch up on the notes from last week. Can you help me or are you busy? I've made you a copy of my notes already to save you time. Here you are. Wow, thanks Sarah. That's so thoughtful. Well, since there's nothing for us to do right now, shall we go for lunch? Well, actually, I'll have to catch you later. I have to go to a meeting this afternoon. Can I phone you tonight to arrange when to meet? No, sorry. I have a date. Can we meet in the laboratory for the first class tomorrow? I'm not sure, because I have to go to the library to collect some books. What about meeting there at lunchtime? Do you mean in the lab? Yes. OK. See you in the laboratory tomorrow at noon, then. Sounds like we have a lot of work to do. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about Crocodilus niloticus and its living habits. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we will continue our study of Crocodilus neoloticus by talking about its living habits. We've already discussed the evolutionary attributes that set it apart from its crocodile relatives. Does everyone remember that? Yes, it has an extremely narrow snout and three or four rows of protective scales on its back as compared to two rows on other members of the Crocodilus genus. Let's take a look at how these carnivorous man-eaters live, where they live, and finally, whether they really deserve their vicious reputation. To start, I'd like to address a great question posed to me by a student during yesterday's office hours. We talked about the distribution of crocodiles in Africa and saw that they are highly concentrated in the south and west of the continent. This student noticed that on the map displaying the distribution of crocodiles across Africa, there were no crocodiles in the northern region and found no mention in the literature of the existence of crocodiles in the north of Africa. Why might there be no crocodiles in North Africa? Let's save this question for later in the lecture. To find out more about the social habits of the African crocodile, one researcher named Tara Shine of the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland conducted a survey of the wetlands in Mauritania and received reports of 46 crocodiles living in one group, or float as we say when referring to crocodiles, though the usual number is a little less than half of that. In general, crocodiles are more highly concentrated in wet subtropical environments near bodies of water and rich vegetation. While South American crocodiles thrive in cool rainforests, the African crocodile is more equipped for heat. Though they can survive at the hot temperatures found in some deserts, they are not equipped to handle dry climates and thus cannot survive in places like the Sahara Desert of North Africa. As cold-blooded animals, crocodiles' core temperatures fluctuate from their average of 38 degrees Celsius as external conditions change. Thus, they need to avoid extreme temperatures. Others live an underwater life, keeping a body temperature close to that of the water. As their own unique method of regulating their body temperatures, some African crocodiles have made dens by digging holes in the ground to provide themselves with a cool, dark place to retreat from the hot African sun. Speaking of the hot African sun, let's go back to the question asked at the beginning of the lecture. We know that there used to be crocodiles in northern Africa, yet today there are none. What are some possible explanations for this? Some students have suggested that the African crocodile has evolved from a desert creature into a wetland creature, thus causing them to migrate south for more appropriate conditions. Others presume that the crocodile was hunted out of northern Africa by a fiercer predator. While these are intelligent guesses, the real story is a little bit different. The key to this migration is that the Sahara Desert did not always cover the north of Africa. About 8,000 years ago, the land was fertile wetlands, perfect for breeding crocodiles. Over time, though, the area dried out and the wetland slowly turned to desert, leading the African crocodile to migrate south to the marshlands they call home today. Some crocodiles did, however, adapt to living in dry conditions. In Mauritania, some crocodiles have learned to survive in an area where they can go up to eight months with no water by spending the driest of times in what's called a torpor, or short period of hibernation. To utilize every bit of rainfall, these desert crocodiles dig underground caves that collect runoff, thus staying cool and hydrated. During the mating period in November and December, males attract females to their viciously protected territory through a number of behaviours that range from snapping their jaws all the way to sending infrasonic pulses through the water. Afterwards, the female digs a hole up to 60 centimetres in depth to store the eggs for an 80-day incubation period. The female protects these eggs during the period and sometimes even helps crack the eggs with her snout at the end. 
These teeth-gnashing carnivores are softer than we think. Although these vicious creatures have attacked humans on a few occasions, the residents are not afraid of them. In fact, they show a great deal of reverence towards these wondrous creatures. Some say that crocodiles bring water to their habitat, so if they leave, they will bring the water with them. Obviously, this is not true, but it demonstrates the admiration the inhabiting people have for crocodiles. Generally, crocodiles do not predate on humans. They attack when humans populate the crocodile's habitat, instilling fear and uneasiness in the crocs. Like any other species, crocodiles are known to attack when feeling fear. There's still a lot more to be discovered about the African crocodile. Researchers want to know more about the population size, how many crocodiles inhabit Africa in all, how they form separate floats, etc. There is still also much to learn about migration patterns and relations to other populations of crocodiles now found in other parts of the world. Next time, we'll examine a few specific case studies of crocodile populations in southern Africa. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.